Hey, friends of the table, Brett here, and uh, we've got a bit of a unique uh, interview for you this week. So uh, as you'll be able to quickly tell, this is not a sermon, and in fact, it was not even recorded during a service. Instead, it's a conversation between myself and my good friend Juanita Johnson. So as we touch on in the intro, Juanita has helped us start uh, both of the church communities that we've launched in the last few years. And she's been just incredibly instrumental in in those efforts. Um, However, she's transitioning off of the elder leadership team as well as out of the table church as a whole, Uh, though you may like see her around from time to time. So uh, the interview kind of gets into all the ins and outs of her process around all this. So I don't really feel the need to like sum it up or anything. Having said that, I do want to encourage you to listen to the entire interview. Now, that's no small task since it is an hour and 20 minutes long, but I've been told by the handful of people who've seen it that it's just really important that people not get you know 20 minutes in and then quit. So the only rule is, if you're gonna start it, then you must finish it. Not necessarily in one sitting, but you must finish it. So all to say, thank you for taking the time to engage this. If you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me, uh, or if you'd like to touch base with Juanita, that's great too. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this. So happy listening, grace, in peace. Welcome, Juanita. Uh, I appreciate you taking time to chat today. Um, So I think many of you should know Juanita. She should be a familiar face. She was doing um, our welcome announcements for many months. And um, then, of course, she's also on the elder team um, at the table. Um, so a little bit of background. Wendy and I, we go way back. <laughs> Maybe like 10, 10 years? How old is Eve? I was trying to think. How old is 11? Did you freeze? Did I lose you? Uh, you froze. At least on you mine. Froze. You're frozen on mine. Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> You're completely frozen. Hold on. I don't know how to fix Oh, there you go. There we go. Um, <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So, was she like born really soon after? We, you were, she had just been born. Okay, so yeah, so 11 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's our, I guess almost 12 because she's almost in, 12 years. Yeah. That's yeah. thinking, yeah. So, we go, we go back a ways and um, we've both been on quite mm-hmm. the journey theologically, like, I mean, kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, so you've recently you finished your master's degree. Um, I did in December. It's finished. <laughs> yes, SMU Perkins mm-hmm. School of Theology. So you have kind of the theological like background and training, um, and of course you've grown up like in church context. So that was already familiar to you. Um, and um, also, in addition to that, like you're you are you're not only one of the smartest people I know. You are mm-hmm. tenacious in your search for the truth. Like you care. Um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted you to be on the elder team back, um, not only at the table, but even before then we started another, uh, church slash campus, whatever you want to call it. And, yeah. uh, so you were on that, uh, that team back in 2017 and then of course the table in 2019. So, um, you, yeah, you're an amazing person and, um, you've been so just influential, um, it, who kind of just in who we've become at the table, you know, everything from our values and vision and um, even our decision to become an affirming congregation or to launch as an affirming congregation. Like you were part of that, you know, whole journey. So um, yeah, so we go like way back, lots of history there. Um, yeah. But you've, you know, you, you've also, you're obviously a black woman in a, in church context, at least recently that have been more, um, you know, majority white. Um, not exclusively, of course, but still majority. And so um, you've been kind of navigating, kind of finding your own way in the midst of that. Uh, And I think it's been, um, you know, like a challenge to put it mildly, like it's a, (laughs) uh, and, uh, and so recently you kind of come to the decision to um, like to step down from the table uh, as an elder. Um, And uh, so that's some of what, where we want to talk today. I mean, partly it just felt really strange to have you just like, well, or just, it's just a random announcement. Like, well, I need to step down. And so yeah. that, 
Um, and so we, we want to hear from you. And it's kind of a learning opportunity for us to, um, you know, hear your experience and um, glean whatever, you know, we can uh, from that. And um, yeah, just kind of learn in that way and share and all that. So um, I'm kind of good with you starting wherever you'd like. I don't know if it's, you know, at the table, if it's previous church, if it's like childhood, I don't know, wherever <laughs> you'd like to, um, and to kind of frame, uh, frame this up. Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, it's hard to prepare for a conversation like this. Like I didn't know coming in what the structure is, but even if I had, I don't know that I could have come up with the best way to um, succinctly describe this kind of, to how I got to this place. Um, in my uh, contemplations of the best way to talk about um, me stepping down as an elder and taking a step back from um, the table, I thought about history kind of the same way that you you talked about it, just the history of the last um, just over a decade of my life, how it how it's been spent. And and as you alluded to, I have spent the last decade um, in in white churches in in and um, and that means something. I think we kind of in progressive spaces, we talk about you know, we kind of throw out that, I think it's Martin Luther King quote about Sunday being the most segregated hour or whatever, whatever the quote is, but it, we talk about that um, in, in kind of pithy ways to, and then pat ourselves on the back for our own diversity. So we say like, but we have black people in our churches and that somehow um, makes that statement, that quote, not true, but that has not been my experience. And, and that doesn't capture what that quote is getting at in that um, Sunday, 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour because not just we don't exist in each other's spaces, black people don't typically, you know, that there are black churches and white churches, but that, that has a theological implication that theologically um, there is a, a theology that's different in a black church than what's practiced in white churches. Um, there's an ideology that's different. There's a ways of living and expressing faith and expressing humanness, what it means to be human um, that are different. And I think sometimes what I've experienced is that those differences it is very difficult for those differences to coexist in a way that is life-giving for both parties. Mm. <clears throat> um, and that has been hard for me to reconcile that I have, in one hand, I have fostered and developed really strong and meaningful relationships with people and on the other hand, I have lost my own humanness, my own sense of being, um, what it means to be a Black woman in America in this time period. Um, and it means something different than it does for um, white people. And so um, I've, just, you know, I've many people don't even probably don't even recognize my face because I have taken some time away from the table. Um, I was um, this past summer with um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and just and just the weight of what it means to be human in America right now has re really got to me and it, it made it so that I was unable to keep um, the facade to keep um, making myself fit into um, a white church um, that got too heavy. And so um, we talked and you got there before I did <laughs> um, and suggested that I take some time away. And, and it was exactly right. I mean, we were very much in sync on different, in different spaces um, that that was the right thing to do. And, and as, I, as I took the time to, um, 
be, to just be where I was, to experience all of the emotions that I was experiencing at that time, um, the anger and frustration, the um, despair and um, grief and lostness. Um, I have never felt so in touch with who I was. And that was freeing. <laughs> that has been freedom for me. And um, and so once I could, once I felt myself and I could under hear myself think again and and understood um the parts of myself that I had lost so along the way and trying to make myself fit into um, kind of this white space, the white faith spaces that I had been a part of, I realized that I couldn't find a way that this new self that I had rediscovered, it's not a new self, it's an old self that I had rediscovered, um, could fit wholly into, back into the white spaces back into the table in a way that was true and authentic and um, reflected who, my own voice and experience. Um, and, so, and so because that's true, because how I see the world, how I engage the world, what I think, um, I, it doesn't fit. <laughs> and, um, and so I think it, for the most honoring thing at that point is to step step down um and so that's that's i think kind of how i got to where i'm at yeah um you you mentioned uh kind of parts of yourself that maybe over the last even like 10 years you know you've kind of maybe got left behind or um and, and then later you had to kind of in this summer, really, you started to, as you stepped away, you started to kind of reintegrate some of those things and find, um, like you said, kind of almost your old self in a way. Um, do you, uh, or would you be willing to share any, like, kind of any examples or, you know, expressions of what that looked like? What did you let go of? What, what how did it get reintegrated? You know, what was that um, kind of experience like over the last, I don't know, it's probably seven or eight months now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, when I did not anticipate, um, so like my five brain, you know, we play these conversations out how they're going to go. So that was not in my um, book of questions that you might've asked me, but it's a good one. I, I think the best example I have, um, was about, is about sacred. What is sacred? Um, and, I had this, a question posed to me during one of my classes this last semester, it's because I was talking about the Bible in a particular way. And the professor asked me about um, what do we do with the Bible as a sacred text when you're talking about it in this way? And I told her that the Bible and texts like it are only sacred, in my opinion, because of the value that the culture community using that text give it. So if the community decides a text is sacred, then that is sacred. And it's not that I don't value the Bible or really, or even hold it as a sacred text. But for me, and the reason I, I brought that up is because I have sacred texts that are not the Bible. Um, one of those texts is Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Um, it is a text, it is a story that I read, um, that I study, that I engage with and have historically. I mean, I read it the first time. I, at an inappropriately young age. Um, and I've read it multiple times since. And it is a text that reminds me of what it means to be human. It reminds me of what it means to live together in wholeness. It, it reminds me of what forgiveness looks like. It reminds me of what um, uh, righteous anger and justice looks like. Um, it is a sacred text to me. Um, and that is something that I didn't have access to, not just that text, but just my um, understanding of sacredness. I didn't have access to, to that understanding through the lens of kind of the white Christianity that I had been 
engaging with. It's not a thing that white spaces and especially within Christianity has room for in ways that are, are um, robust. I think so. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, not that like literally uh, a white church or something, you know, would never talk about justice or, or something, but it's, it's a little bit, it's different and it's certainly not drawing from the same exact same experiences or, you know, in a way that would make, for, for example, that the book you mentioned, like really resonate and become, be like a sacred text um, for someone who looks like me. You know I mean? Right. It's possible theoretically or something, maybe, you know, it wouldn't be race, but it would maybe for a different reason. I just love that book or something, but it's, it's sort of unlikely and certainly isn't like widespread in a way where right. the, the whole church culture also resonates with that exact experience. And um, at least in a widespread way, is that my track? Yes. Or yes, I would say that's, I, that's a good way to put it. Or even the, the importance of that kind of text being part of the canon of our faith is different. Like that's a different way of engaging theologically that I don't experience or I don't have access to. That's what I wanna say it that way. I don't have access to through this kind of, from the perspective of a white church. In the and when I say that I, I'm trying to be precise. When I say white church and I'm referencing spaces like the table or the other churches that you and I have been a part of, I'm saying I want to go back again to what I said earlier. Is that that has a particular ideology that has a particular theology, expressed or unexpressed, um, that does not allow for the things that I. There's no room for it in in my experience for those other types of engagements. I'm, I'm wondering about, um, it's kind of specifically the, the idea of like, you know, the Bible, sacred texts, maybe other sacred texts, and how would you say, like, for example, obviously the table's a little bit more kind of progressive -y, mm -hmm. even the way we view the Bible, like, yeah. you know, inerrantists and things like that. Um, so I'm wondering, how would you kind of describe the way that at least, you know, you, you experience that kind of at the table, you know, where... We're not necessarily saying like, you know, I mean, for example, I've had criticism that I quote too many different people to, you know, not just the Bible. Here's the text. This, our sermon is a Bible study. You know, it's almost like we're drawing, like that's one of our values eclectic. So I tend to draw from quotes and theologies and things. So it's not necessarily that biblical way. And yet there is something you're picking up on or naming. So I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think here's how will I say this I think so I I know the values of the table I wrote them <laughs> um and I do think that at the table more than any other white church that I've experienced there is the desire in the and an effort to think more broadly um, about theology, about our theological practices and how that shows up really in the world and what are the parts, you know, from traditional Christian theologies that it fits. I think the limits, here's what I would say. The limits of the table and that what I was experiencing was that when you are the majority, when you have a majority of perspectives that are white, there's a limit to the vision for your progression. So yes, the table is a progressive church. Its ability to see beyond the limits of whiteness is stunted by its majority white lens. And so I, 
it, I want to acknowledge that at the table, there is a concerted effort to keep pushing that lens and to keep seeing beyond whiteness. I do, that is one of the things that I know. It's why I, I still want to contribute. I still want to, you know, in the ways that I can participate at the table, still do that. But it is still a, a white church and their limits. And for me and my experience and my own journey, those limits are crushing. Those limits are, they are like a ill-fitted shirt that I couldn't get out of. <laughs> and, and because it's the majority and it was only me and leadership, I didn't even have someone to help pull it off of me, right? Like I didn't have someone to like support me from my vantage point. And that isn't about desire or intention. I know, the, I mean, I, I know the leadership at the table. I know the community there, but those desires are, are, are limited by that view, by those lenses and I I couldn't I can't continue like there's no other role for me to play there I I had gone beyond my ability to contribute anymore does that make sense uh I I think so I or I I'm kind of I'm wondering if what I'm getting in my head is like I don't actually know if I'm if I'm really getting it, you know what I mean? So right. well, tell me, well, tell me what you're getting. So like, I want to, I'm trying to be clear, but yeah. 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 Um, um, I mean, it, yeah, it may be, Oh, I think kind of some of what I'm kind of trying to think through is, um, the, the degree to what you're, you're naming is kind of, um, a part of like a more, I don't know what the term would be, like to what degree do you think this is kind of inbuilt into Christianity mm -hmm. in a way and kind of applies maybe to all churches, mm -hmm. perhaps even some black churches? I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. there could be like a really progressive black church that, mm -hmm. does, you know I mean? That's, mm -hmm. I think that's where I'm getting a little bit, um, I don't know if tripped up is the right word, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, huh, am huh. I tracking or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding or, yeah, so I don't, maybe you could give it yeah. a little detail to whatever degree you're. Sure. Yeah, I would, I mean, that's, uh, that's actually helpful to know kind of what you're hearing because yes, I would say some of where I've landed is about kind of um, the American church in general, right? So some of my, um, some of the limits that I'm seeing is, is, broad strokes, not just at the table. Um, and that there are certain black churches, like I don't, I'm not leaving the table to go to a predominantly black church. It's not on, on my list of things to do because I do see some churches, black churches who participate in some of the things that I, I also have critique for. Um, so Yes, that is, I'm, I am seeing that some of it is just the limits of American Christianity, of, of the ways in which we practice faith in America, um, that we've inherited, we've all been taught these certain ways of, of thinking, uh, thinking and interacting with faith that I see as limiting um, in, in many ways. I think for me, what's about the table specifically is I kind of want to shift a little bit. I think, and when I was talking about kind of the limits of um, whiteness at the table and, and my own experience, the way that I went to Evolving Faith a couple of years ago. We talked about this. I went to Evolving Faith. And if you know what Evolving Faith is, it's a it's a conference of progressive Christians. It was started by uh, one of Rachel Held Evans was one of the founders who I love and adore her. Um, but I went for the first time uh, a couple of years ago. 
um, with a friend and I was very excited because it had this roster of black women as part of the speaking uh, team that I was super excited to experience and listen to. And I got there and the audience was almost 99% white, even though it had this, I mean, I think there was like five black women there that, I mean, it was really a and great <laughs> um, speakers and teachers. And it was oppressively white. It was like <laughs> scary white. <laughs> um, and I remember sitting there um, on one of the nights, it was like one of the last nights and Dr. Um, Shaniqua Walker Barnes was speaking. And I was sitting there and I was listening to this black woman preach and speak and I remember thinking to myself she is here and the way that I am experiencing her is as someone who is speaking to me I was her audience the me and the five other black women who found ourselves in the crowd white people but my the other women that were there, and I know this because I, I went with two other white women, I mean, shame on me, but, and, and I was listening to the crowd, they were experiencing her as almost entertainment, as not quite a show, but it was way more enjoyable than it was the comforting nurturing, soul forming experience that I was having with her. And I left thinking like, this is a progressive space that acknowledges like race and the complexity of race. They had like a room for like it, it truly, the leadership truly intentionally was trying to build a space where all would feel welcome and comfortable. And it was intentional about having speakers that would speak to different experiences. But the end result was still a space that was, a, that was super white in which I was having a completely different experience than the other people were having. And that is what it's like at the table. It's a lot, like all of the intention, all of the work is done there. Like it's being done and that will yield hopefully in years, good results where what was happening at Evolving Faith with me won't happen. And what I experienced at the table of feeling like, because I, I, I didn't have, I don't have those experiences at the table where I feel nurtured and cared for and my soul is being shaped. And that's not, a knock on the table. It's just not available at the table. Are you saying um, my sermons suck? Is that what you're No, saying? I'm not saying that. I'm, just, I'm joking. I'm joking. No. But I'm just, those are, those are things that you, you, you cannot yet offer. And for where I am in my faith and my journey, that is what I need. I, I need not just to be nurtured in that way, but to participate in the nurturing in that way. And right now, or what I was at the table was not that. I was more of, I was, I was, when Dr. Walker Barnes is speaking, I was kind of the entertainment. Like I'm kind of the, I was kind of the, I, I, I give that mission, I gave the mission validity because I was a black woman. I'm a black woman in that space. So I give the work that the table is trying to do validity, but I don't want to do that. I want to nurture. I want to be nurtured. I want to speak and be with people that understand the language that I'm speaking, um, not have to edit in order to be understood even just a little bit. Uh, yeah, no, I, so here's what's coming to mind. And and I'm very open to your thoughts on this, pushback, all sorts of things. Sure. Um, so you're describing, I think it's a great example of this progressive conference, you know, where this is not a room full of folks who are like, you know, systemic racism, that isn't a thing, you know, no, no, these are folks who are like, 
that's the kind of thing they tweet, you know? And, yes. And they, I mean, and then in the way that I think maps onto the table is a great little example. And maybe we're not quite even that progressive, but pretty close to a number. I mean, yeah. we're being cast in our, uh, you know, reading group and things, and we have our Be the Bridge group. And, you know, we're, uh, I mean, even right on my little bookshelf over there, White Fragility by Robert <laughs> Angelo. You know, I'm yeah. trying to learn and take in the perspectives, all this. Um, so I think it's a great image in a way. Now, here's um, where my mind goes. This is what I've been thinking on recently. And we might kind of diverge paths here, but I'm curious as to your perspective. The, the thought that's been coming to me is, um, to what degree is this a cultural gap versus something like actually, you know, racism or, or um, even, even in a, a more kind of unintentional, you know, uh, way. Uh, because I don't, I don't mean to say like, you know, people are being overtly racist, I, but, but just the idea of, um, yeah, to, to what degree is, is that the experience? So for example, that Christian conference, you know, intentionally in their leadership and who they're having speaking, like you said, they choose people like we're gonna have a diverse lineup and yet the audience that shows up is largely white. Um, or as Martin Luther King Jr. said, Sunday morning is still largely segregated, you know? And that was true in the sixties and it continues to be true today. Uh, why is that? And what it's where I think my own mind has been going is to what degree is this a cultural gap that we're trying to overcome here that all of our Robin D'Angelo reading will not actually overcome? And again, I think maybe, I don't know if this is where we're on different pages or mm -hmm. kind of agree, but in other ways, no, I'm not sure. Because I kind of heard you naming earlier almost a way in which maybe the table over time could become, you know, um, mm. like when I hear, and, and some of this may even come down to the definition of whiteness and things like that. Mm -hmm. so what degree is it cultural? Is it, mm -hmm. or is it something a little bit nastier and kind of racist and, you know, or kind of unconscious mm -hmm. bias or something along those lines? Um, because I, it, the thought that comes to me is I, I don't think we'll be able to overcome that exactly. I'm not sure, you know, yeah. anyway, so I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts. No, that's a, um, that's good. Um, that's a really good question. And I, I would say that it is cultural as a result of racism and the ways that racism has shaped both white culture and created black culture in America. And to that degree, overcoming it isn't necessarily what I envision the potential for the table is not to overcome the cultures. I think that is we're talking, I mean, that's an that's to imagine something that I don't, I can't even like, my brain does not go that far in the future. We're so far away from overcoming those cultural, um, the ways in which we've developed culturally separately in white culture and black culture. I, I, I just think we're so far from that, that I can't even imagine it. But what I do see as possible is that the that progressive communities like the table that are committed or consciously working towards what do we do about this race thing in America, this racism thing, not this race thing, is that they will be able to to be so conscious of race and their own racial culture that they can figure out how to fit it in with the other cultures that are already race conscious. Like to be black in America is to be culturally aware in a way that white America is not, does not have to be. And so that's why like Robin D'Angelo is so popular. It's not because she's saying anything really revolutionary or like brilliant to the black to black people like we already knew this she's writing something that black people already knew and had been writing about what's new is for white people to start seeing themselves and their culture and the way that they've been developed and shaped um, by racism as much as black people have and so I don't 
I don't see it as a thing that the table can overcome. I think it's a thing that the table can be more intimately aware of and conscious of. This is why thoughtfulness is such for me. It's the most important value at the table. It's because that's the that's the value that will help drive that cultural competency. And I think that is really what like white progressive spaces need is white cultural competency. This is what you're lacking. Um, and and you can Robin D'Angelo is a good place to start, but she is certainly um, limited in her vision, I think. So broaden that as well. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's helpful. When you when you say, well, let me kind of recap what I was kind of hearing hearing you say, and you can tell me to what degree I'm perhaps wildly off. So, um, you were kind of naming that, uh, or this is I'm not even to use your exact words. This is kind of what I was hearing that uh, more minority cultures, whether it's you know Hispanic American or or someone from the Black community, they kind of automatically have to think of themselves in terms of their own culture. You know, they're not just quote unquote normal or you know whatever whenever you grow up in the majority you just tend to default to that and just think this is normal and then anyone else is you know the anomaly or something so what i'm kind of hearing you say is that that uh that you know for example you had to grow up both kind of learning and you learned your own kind of black culture and then learned to be kind of uh do a cross-cultural thing learned how to be kind of in more white spaces and and that's kind of everything from you know potentially dress to speech to cultural references to you know uh, I mean all sorts of things um and what I'm so what I'm hearing you say is that's something that more um folks like yourself have had to learn to do and that um uh white Christian or white churches white folks, we'll just go even there. Um, in, in order to have more diverse churches, we'll need to um, learn that the other way, learn the other um, different culture and um, become kind of fluent in that more cross-cultural uh, kind of not only awareness, but just knowledge and understanding so that there can be more of a shared experience and uh, friendship and connection and then eventually more diverse churches and church experiences and among other things uh is that yeah i would say but it starts i would just say that i would just add that it's not just the inverse but that you have to start from the beginning and that's to learn like white churches white people who are concerned with racism and what we're going to do about that in america is you have they would have to start with their own culture. There is nothing, when you're part of the majority group, there's nothing that, um, there's no incentives, there's no drivers, and there's nothing actually available to you without intentionality to teach you about your own culture, to teach you, you you just kind of ad adapt to it um, unconsciously. Like you adopt ideologies and things, practices and assumptions about what is normal and good and true and right unconsciously um, because you're in the majority. All of that is, is readily available to you. Um, and so in order to do the cross, in order to understand another culture, you first have to understand your own and what how it's been formed, how it's been shaped, what it means for your the ways in which you move in the world and how those movements are different than the way other communities have had to learn to grow and move in the world. Um, so I, yes, that I do mean cultural competence. You do have to learn the other culture, but I think for me, my experience and not just my life experience and what I've learned throughout, I'm almost 36, is that that has to happen first, that there's nothing, I can't offer you anything until that is done. And I think this is why we keep coming back, like why people get so sick of talking about racism. It's because this has never happened in America. White people have never reckoned with and dealt with white, what it means to be a white American and, and what what that means. 
Um, yeah, yeah, I, no, I think I'm tracking. I'm, um, I, th I think maybe one thing that might be a little helpful, I'm, I'm just trying to think of, you know, folks listening, is um, when you say, you know, learn about your own culture, things like that, what, what, what do you have in mind? Are you thinking specifically learn your history, specifically in terms of like race and how that played out kind of the, the ugly side of American history? Is that kind of what you're referring to or, or is it something else? Cause I'm imagining people may be thinking like, learn my culture. Well, I already know my culture. Like that's my thing, you know what I mean? Or. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's good clarification. I would say, um, I would say um, learning history would be a good place to start. I, I do find that, um, again, because whiteness is, is the majority, it's the dominant uh, culture in America, um, it takes conscientiousness in order to actually develop an understanding of your own history. Like, um, if history, if history is written by the victors, white America is the victor. And so it takes um, a level of, of conscientiousness to ask more questions about the story you were given of that history of dominance, of, of winning, um, to ask questions about what does, what did the losers have to say about this experience, about this story? Um, in order to have a complete picture of his, in order to have an accurate historical understanding. So white people assume that they know their history until someone like uh, Hannah Nicole Jones or, yeah, uh, comes back and writes the 1619 Project. And then we're all up in arms because now you're rewriting our history versus the history that I've been taught, you know, from primary school. Um, and again, this stuff is not, it's not, if you are not looking for it, it is not available to you. It's not, uh, that's been, I mean, as a black woman, I spent the month of January and I told myself, actually, I'm still in it. I'm only reading and engaging with material and work by black women. That's what I told myself. I have to every day. It is, it takes work for me to find and access the, the material and the stuff that I'm wanting to engage with because it is not part of the dominant culture. It's not part of what sells in America. Um, and so I have to actually do work to find what I am looking for. And so, yeah, it's not the thing that's, it's not fast food. You'd actually have to do work to, to get to what I'm saying about um, a clear understanding. And one of the ways to do that is to work backwards, like to go back to your point, like you could read Black people writing about white people, their narratives and stuff like that, that would be a good place to start. But it, it's also moving beyond that and talking to yourselves about, I read this story about this Black story. I know that the book club read um, oh, The Other Sister, whatever. I forget the name of that title. Okay. But it's a, it's, um, it's a really brilliant book. Is it vanished? I forget. Uh, it's a brilliant book. I just read it. I read so many books in the last month. But um, that's a story about uh, twin sisters, one um, who were part of this super light-skinned community that only let it, wanted light-skinned children. And then one of them went off and she's passing for white and the other married a super dark scene. So it's a whole book about colorism. And so there's one way that white people could read the story and think, man, that's really, that sucks. Like, why? Why would they care? And it's another thing to, as a white person, think, okay, wait, why is it important? Why was it necessary for this other sister to become white? And then to ask yourself, is that a thing that Black people actually did, that they actually chose to abandon their families in order to become this other white thing, to completely crush themselves in a particular way in order to live in society? Why would that be necessary? What in society made that necessary? And then to get to the question, oh, it's because the only way to make a good living, the only way to have respectable standing in society, the only way to be deemed acceptable is to be white. 
that takes work. That takes like deep questioning and cycles of digging in order to get to that conclusion. And that is what, I mean, that's a whole rant, but that's what I mean. That's the kind of work that only white people could do. I, and black people can't give that to you. They have their only own stuff to work through. Like we can't, I, I can't do that for you. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so kind of, to kind of recap that when you're, so when you're th- going back to that picture of being at the conference with all the white folks, um, or at, you know, table, a church that, again, we're talking about more for kind of progressive, so to speak, that's a clunky term, I get it, but, you know, it is, it, it we're not talking about super conservative spaces or something, you know, like, um, these are places that slant theologically and politically, um, you know, more, more left-leaning, um, that, that in those spaces, what, what I hear you naming is what would really help would be for those folks to um, engage some of the perspectives, the material uh, that you're naming, you know, that to, to learn about white culture from a different um, set of eyes, from a different perspective, um, to kind of learn some of the alternative history and, and things like that, not um, in that you, you think that would kind of get us down the road a ways in terms of um, being able to, to at some point have more diverse churches and in a, in a natural way, things like that. And is that a good recap? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a good recap. And I think um, the picture, I think if, if I'm thinking of a picture of what this looks like, what, why understanding your own culture is important. Um, I grew up, so I, I actually grew up in, in New York. I don't talk about it often because that was an earlier part of my life, but um where I lived in New York, we were Black and Puerto Rican, and very um, specific cultures, but we engage with one another all the time in a myriad of ways from our own cultural vantage points, and we're able to celebrate and um, partake with one another from a place of honesty without um, aggression. And I think this is why even well-meaning, well-intentioned white people cannot, like they, there's always harm, even unintentional harm, because without clear cultural competency, without clear cultural understandings of what you're bringing with you, you're always gonna be bringing aggression because you don't know what you're carrying. You don't know, you don't even know, understand where the landmines are, where the potholes are because you're I'm saying you I'm, and I apologize I don't mean you I mean white people in general um you don't even know where they are um and I think as a this kind of progressive space I do want to talk about it it's a very popular kind of churchy space to be in it's very um, it's the next wave. Christianity always has a new wave. This progressive Christianity is that right now, the quote unquote. You think it's going to catch on? I mean, sure. I think it has caught on. I think, <laughs> I, think cool. I think the skinny, you know, I think the whole vibe is, is pretty popular. <laughs> yeah. well, I think I'm the, kind of a little bit lonely in, in Saxe in the suburbs. As a, you as a are, I mean, but. where we are in North <laughs> Texas, not so much, but in general, it's, yeah, it's a pretty, it's, um, it's not a unique uh, yeah. position. The challenge with, I think this new wave, um, this current wave in Christianity, and I think probably historically, every time there's a new wave, is that it returns to its old patterns of, well, no, erase what I just said. The problem with this new wave is that with regards to racism and these, the challenges of having authentic multicultural communities that cease to perpetuate harm and are celebrations 
of God's true diversity and delight in humanity is that the culture, American culture, outside of the church is seductive white American culture. It is seductive and it reinvents itself. And it reinvents itself in the progressive movements that the church attempts every, I mean, if you, when you study church history and you study particularly this, it reinvents itself. And so I think this is why we have not in the church, especially, I mean, we've had so many decades to get racism together and still we fail. And that's, I say that the collective we, but I mean white churches, it still fails because whiteness, white supremacy, white culture in America is seductive and it reinvents itself. It, it finds new ways to um, adjust to whatever is progressive and recapture it um, to reel it back in to wanting um, power. And as progressive movements gain more popularity, they get more access to power. And that is where they are seduced. And so this is the challenge of places like the table is the seductive nature of your own popularity. The table, I have no doubt, is going to be a really thriving and full community. What makes me anxious and what I actually think <laughs> I've prayed on a number of occasions, Lord, let them stay small, <laughs> is because the greater your influence, the more seductive power becomes. And whiteness and white supremacy in America is a power dynamic. Uh, this is as you study and become more familiar with your own culture. The culture, and I want to come back to that, is, is, is its ties to power. I think for me, this is, I, even in the churches, our previous church, this is one of the things that I experience is the seductive nature. Like, yeah, you were progressive. They were progressive at one point, but the seductive nature of power and the ways in which whiteness can, um, yeah, it reinvents itself so that it can hold on to power. Um, I'm I'm curious because I'm, I'm kind of trying to think through. Um, well, I'll just frame it like this. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. How would you? How do you interpret um, churches that are today? quite culturally diverse mm -hmm. um, because it, it kind of, and, and where I'm coming from on this um, is, you know, when you think of a church, well, thinking of that, that conference or the table or any of these places that are trying to start going down that road in, in mm -hmm. small ways. And mm -hmm. I'm even the first to say like still inadequate, but you know, doing our best mm -hmm. to like get down that road and start educating ourselves and learning and things like that. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's interesting that you have that, in other words, some of the most, um, conservative theological and political spaces are also the most diverse. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to make sense of that a little bit. And it's something I've been thinking of, and I, I just wondered how it strikes you and how you, yeah, interpret it, see it fitting into kind of even, um, the, some of the perspective you were naming, you know, like how does, yeah, is, I mean, is it, well, I'll come back. Maybe it's the melting pot versus the salad bowl analogies thing, which I can come back and unpack if we need to, but. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah. Um, so I, I want to say two things. I would say, I would say that I, I know of churches um, that are 
consciously working on what does it look like to have a truly multicultural church? Um, so churches where um, the head leadership, there's a, a black leader and, and board and a white leader and board and that they're um, working on shared power, um, shared like worship and spaces and all of that. So I know of churches that those kinds of multicultural churches are they're kind of um, that are actually significantly different than most um, kind of progressive churches that are headed by kind of white leadership, majority white leaderships and stuff. Um, and I see those as different. Like I see those kind of like projects, kind of like these, this is a grand experiment. I wonder, I'm, and I'm curious as to how, how they're, it's going to go. But I mean, I do know of churches like that and I applaud and celebrate and like truly, I'm sure those are thriving communities. Um, and then I do know what you're speaking about, about these um, conservative churches. And I, I think I want to go back to that example. I wish I could remember the title of that book right now. But the thing about power and the desire for power and legitimacy, that is seductive for all people. That is, a, I mean, that's not just a seduction for white people. That is a seduction for all people. And when whiteness offers power and legitimacy, even in a false sense, because it is false, um, it, it is seductive. And some people would rather, and not, and in a more charitable sense, not just power and legitimacy, but with those things come a measure of safety and security. I think for me, honestly, if I'm honest with myself, it was really hard. What took me so long to get to this place where I realized it, I don't fit was about my own safety and security. It was about like, these are my, all of my connections are here. All of my people are in this space. To walk away, I risk relationships that are meaningful to me. I risk, um, there is a trajectory that I could go on with the table that is a measure of security that I no longer have walking away. And so the choice to people of color and uh, in those spaces, like that's a, that's a choice for safety, for legitimacy, for power for some people. And I think there, that will always exist. <laughs> you know, that's always a real thing. I, I watched the um, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah this past weekend. Have you seen this movie? Um, it's about Fred Hampton. Uh, and it's about the, it's actually about the guy who, um, who colluded with the FBI. He was used by the FBI as an informant, and then he drugged uh, um, Fred Hampton on the night that the FBI, that the police murdered him. And it's about his this man's story. And one of the things that I just kept thinking about, about this man, because he's Black, and he, he colluded with the FBI to have another Black man murdered who was working for the good of the people in Chicago. But I just kept feeling sorry for him because he truly, all he wanted was to feel legitimate, to feel powerful. And he was used and manipulated for whiteness. And he did, he, he experienced for a time um, privileges, you know, he got a car, he was set up with a job and money, but ultimately it was death for him. He, I mean, he was tortured for the rest of his life. Now, I'm not saying that all people, you know, who, who participate in these types of churches experience that, but I am saying, I use that as an illustration as to the ways in which the power structure is, can provide these things that would make people stick around that would make people want to participate in it if nothing else because they want to feel safe and secure and that that is what power offers in some sense even if it's perverted yeah what uh would, would you say then when you kind of use the term whiteness it's 
it's kind of a little bit of maybe both and, or it's maybe you, you can use it in different ways. That sometimes when you say whiteness, you're kind of just talking about white majority culture. Um, um, or and or, I'm not sure if it's an and or or, but you can clarify. Um, and then other times it's, you know, whiteness in a more kind of pejorative sense, you know, more, more negative, more that kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to kind of think how to define it. it. It's a little bit vague in my mind, but just whiteness in the sense of, of at times overtly racist and, um, uh, and, and at the very least, um, or like you were using the term power. So kind of as a, a uh, I don't know, like a power structure or, or something that ensures um, white, not literally just white people, but somehow white culture remains first or something. I, I think I'm, I'm trying to kind of navigate those. Are those in your mind, it, can those be teased apart? Can those not? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's a good question. I, where I am today, no, this is subject to change. Um, where I am today, those are the same. Uh, and I, I do, I think I think, I think it is clearest to say that they are the same in my mind. That is not to say, I think that all people in all the ways they participate in whiteness are aware of it or or even um, even in unawares are trying to have power over. But I think that is ultimately I, so I think because whiteness is constructed in, in America, it has been constructed in America in the same way that blackness has been, it is a unique construction in America. The ways in which it was constructed, it is and has been constructed, it, its um, base is a power dynamic. It's what it, what white supremacy, white culture ultimately is in America right now, as it stands, is a power dynamic. And that has been at war with itself and others since its, since its construction. Um, and that's why it sucked in other cultures like the Irish got sucked in, the Italians got sucked in um, because that's the way in which it could maintain its dominance. Um, and I think it's the most helpful, honestly, it doesn't feel good if you're white I can imagine, like, it doesn't feel good to think of yourself as part of this and in your expressions of your own culture as playing power games. But I think it's the most clear way to understand why we're in the cultural moment and we cannot move beyond racism in America. We cannot move beyond this gap that we're all experiencing. Why can we not see one another? I think this power structure first has to be reckoned with and named and worked through before. And I think being clear about what it is helps us to do that, helps white people to do that, in my opinion. Um, it's not pleasant, but just because something is not pleasant and is uncomfortable and makes you question doesn't mean it's not something that we should name it something else or try and tease it beyond recognition or beyond that kind of clarity. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, when, when you say kind of like a power structure, what do you kind of have in mind? Because I'm, I'm trying to think of if folks are listening mm -hmm. and what, I, I wonder if it might be still quite vague, you know, in terms yeah. of why, what does it mean to participate in whiteness or like, and, and honestly, um, this is something I've been thinking quite a bit about as I, um, as I think through, I mentioned earlier, the metaphors of the melting pot versus the salad bowl. 
and this is something that sometimes in you know diversity training and things people will kind of use these metaphors of you know is America the melting pot where you have all of the cultures kind of, you know coming all down into um, this sort of not literally that everyone's like the Borg like exactly alike in every way but with but still there's kind of very common values common stories common you know uh, like is that is it that kind of what we're doing um, or is it more of the salad bowl you know kind of we're going to retain our differences and our very different cultures um, but still you know kind of be a, a nation or you know anyway um, and so, and kind of what I hear you naming is potentially to, like you're maybe, this, I'm anticipating your critique of the melting pot metaphor would be that that is, um, that is whiteness, that that's, that what you're kind of being siphoned down into is at its root, a not good thing, which is why we wouldn't want to go that way. And, and so I think I'm trying to get a little clarity, assuming you would agree with that you know, what's, I'm trying to get it. Yeah. At, what is that thing? <laughs> so to speak, what's that? Yeah. I don't know if, if you have the language for it, but yeah. So I, I definitely, um, the salad bowl melting pot, um, that's right. So the, the melting pot idea is the problematic one, right? It's this idea that we will somehow all come together and meld as one. The problem with this analogy is that the one assumed is the ideologies and practices and and values and um cultural understandings of white people would be the one because it's the dominant culture it's the dominant story in america um and that the salad bowl is actually the it's let's not talk about america but in a church like this would be this is the picture of the fullness of of ourselves and God as one is as a salad, as a human person, not just made up of a nose, but also ears and eyes. Like that's the picture that we put, all have our parts. Um, the challenge, and so this, it gets me back to, to understanding history and formation and, and how we're formed, how, how white people have been formed in America, black people have been formed in America. So. Um, is that um, white people are already a melting pot, have, have already melded into um, a singular uh, cultural identity. And this is the one concerned with power. Um, this is when I was talking about the Irish and the Italians and the Germans, they all kind of said, we're all gonna be white now. <laughs> um, and this is the one that continues. This is the one that's in a permanent culture war here in America. It's a it's a never ending war to maintain that type of dominance. And as a result, white people, even though they all have you all have distinct cultures that you had before whiteness, American whiteness, um, bought into and continue to participate in unwittingly in a lot of cases, but also lazily. And this is my other point. Um, whereas black people lost, they were given a culture, they were forced a culture upon that we then adopted and said, okay, this is who we are. Um, when black people got here, we were multitude of cultures and then forced into one culture, the slave and one way of speaking, and then had to adapt and adjust and reimagine what it means to be Black. Um, this is why the worship expression is so unique in a Black church than a white church, because it's reflective of the African roots, like um, speech patterns. Ones I, I don't use with you are completely different linguistically because they reflect our African roots. Black people across the board are aware of this. This is why we have things like code switching. This is, I mean, we have a whole, uh, we, Black famous, like the artists that you will never, white people never hear of, but are just, it's, 
we know us like I just know an artist came on the other day on my Spotify and I started singing a song and I thought oh Mindy would never know this song like it just wouldn't be in her lexicon um but and so that's when I to go back to my point earlier about understanding cultural competence competencies is is that lack of awareness or work to to um demultify yourselves to come outside of um, the dominant story about what it means to be white in America, to adopt a new way of being um, that is more culturally, comp that is more in line with who you are actually before your whiteness was associated with power. Um, Lisa Sharon Harper does a much better story, uh, way uh, does much better of explaining that process as a lot of her work um or some of what she says uh, about finding out who you were before you, you were white is is important black people do that unconsciously and then adopted and 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 develop their own ways of being outside of whiteness as a result of what was forced upon them blackness was forced upon them um so yeah yeah i i it um yeah, it strikes me that in many ways that really, I think, starts to get at the heart of um, the whole the whole kind of discussion that's that's happening, um, not just in more progressive spaces, but even conservative spaces. And um, and this is a, a I think it's a really big I don't know what the term would be fork in the road maybe metaphor you know of of um, what is whiteness and white culture? What is American dominant culture? Um, to what degree is that kind of rooted in really not good things? How do we leave those things behind? Um, how, uh, to what degree is, is whiteness just, you know, some just like any other culture, good and bad, or kind of particularly like, uh, and then what does that mean for white people? And then what did it, I, I just think it's sort of like this, this, uh, I don't know, like just this whole constellation of questions mm -hmm. that depending on how we answer them start to send us down quite different, you know, paths in terms of thinking, um, how, what's the way forward, you know, because mm -hmm. I think we're, um, there's probably a lot of resonance. I mean, not even just between you and I, but even between us and people who'd be very different from us politically, theologically, in terms of feeling in our kind of guts, the, some of the problems mm -hmm. um, in the sense of like, ah, there's the, whether it's the Sunday morning segregation thing or um, the, the, well, I mean, that's a good example, just in a church way, like that we kind of feel like, ah, I, we want to bridge this. We want to, I mean, even our little curriculum, be the bridge. I want to be the bridge. You know, how, how do we be the bridge? What is that bridge? And, um, and it's, it, yeah, it strikes me that this is a, this is a huge um, question and um, how we answer it at the table, how you answer it, how I answer it, even in our, you know, our own lives. Um, and as a culture is a really, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big one. It has ripple effects. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, so yes, I, this is, I, yes, absolutely. I think I wrote about this recently. I think we are at an inflection point in our country. I think we're at a, we are in a liminal space of opportunity currently. Um, and what we all assume as these um, insurmountable um, things, I do not think they're so far away from us. We, <laughs> We think of American history as this ancient thing, but it is brand new. Like we are a brand new country. Yeah. We are in the history of human experience. We do not even register in the timeline. Like we are so young. We are babies. Um, 
And because I think if you look at just all of the wreckage and ruin of our current of 2020 and 2021 has not started off well, I do see, and I, I think even the continued progress of these kinds of conversations and all of the questions that we're now asking as a result of these questions, I do see that this current period that we are living through and um, conscious in as a liminal space, as a space of opportunity. And I see the problem as not as massive as it has been built up in our minds. It is, I, you know, it's Isaiah is that passage um, in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 58. Uh, about um, being a repair of the breach. This is for me the most important verse in the Bible about what we're called to do as humans is to repair the breach. And so this is why bridges for me don't work. I just think bridges are, they always fall. <laughs> they never work. They, they, they do not last. We do not need more bridges. We need to repair the breach. And I, I do believe just on a hopeful note, that we are living in a liminal space. And I do believe that the problem is not as big as it seems in our mind because it had it's so big in our mind because it's so atrocious. And we we are only cognizant of history in of the like last 100 years. We cannot like encompass the actual human history, the length of time that human history encompasses. We don't have perspective like that. Um, that we make it massive. I, I think we have an opportunity. I think churches like the table um, have an opportunity. They have space. And I think the time is, yeah, I think there's time to have a different kind of story than like the civil rights movement where we're still here, right? Like that was successful on one hand, but also how far did it really take us on the other in terms of human, our interactions as humans? Um, so I get that the questions are big in that it could lead us in very different places, but I also think we're in a liminal space and that we could choose a different story. I don't think the problems are that big. I do think it would require us to I do think it requires us to have vision and imagination beyond what we've been capable of thus far. Um, that's beautifully put. How, I, I think we've been going for a while now. So yeah. um, I, I'm wondering what would you, um, yeah, what would you say like to just folks at the table, you know, like or listen to this and kind of, you know, trying to take it all in. Maybe for some of them, this is, like things that they think about all the time, they're very in the loop. And and then for others, it's like, you know, they're like, whoa, I have not thought in these ways before. You know, um, yeah, what would you say to, I mean, you know, you know the folks at the table pretty well. I do. Any, any parting uh, kind of final thoughts? I mean, that was my hopeful spiel, <laughs> but I, I um, it is that. So I do want to reiterate that I am not leaving because I am without hope for the table or any um, spaces of faith. I am leaving because I believe in the liminal, that we're in a liminal space and that I have work to do in repairing the breach. That's what I believe. That's why for me, I'm limited because I can't do the work of bringing white people along because I have another work to do. So that's, but it's not, I'm not without hope. I am full of hope and excitement for this liminal space and the possibilities of it. I would say for the table, that I would say first that our the values of the table are only as useful and um, revolutionary as the community is willing to push the definition and meaning and experience of those values beyond what's written on the page, what we know right now, but to keep expanding the borders of those values. Um, and not just 
expand the borders of those values in word, but in deed. Um, th that is a lesson from our previous ex church experience that these are good, keep going. And so that's what I would say first at the table, these values are good, keep going. I think the other thing I would say is there is nothing but time and opportunity. That's all we have, time and opportunity. And the table is situated in a community that in which their engagement in the full spectrum of the human experience is welcome and wanted. And that that is our, that is the ways in which we can model Jesus in the world is to be fully engaged in our own humanness and the humanness of others and in the community in which we are placed. And I, if the table can keep its eyes on its community and the humanness of itself, and the community that's gauging nothing but time and opportunity. Great things will happen. Not great things, no. Don't look for great things, look for good things. Not great things. We have enough greatness in the United States. We need goodness. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for taking time and thanks for being a part uh, of our community this last year and um, we are we are better for it, and uh, and I'm better for your friendship. So, yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. And if someone has questions and they're concerned in emailing you, Brett, you can send them to me. I'm not a closed book, so I'm willing to engage if people are curious. Cool. All right. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs>